XRP just beat the SEC. The price is pumping. What a day. Joining us today, Bitcoin attorney, Haley Lennon. I cannot imagine a greater guest to be dropping this knowledge. Haley is a corporate partner at Brown Rudnick. Previously, regulatory counsel for Coinbase, Bitfly and Silvergate Bank with over 90,000 followers on Twitter, a regulatory analyst for Forbes. Haley, she handles regulatory compliance, FinCEN, OFAC, SEC, CFTC, front-end compliance and investigation enforcement actions. The founder of Crypto Connect, get ready to have the veil lifted. Haley, this is such an honor to have you joining us today. For those of us who have not met you yet, can we have a quick introduction of who is Haley? What's a Bitcoin crypto attorney? And what did you mean? And I quote from your tweet, the 3rd of July saying Bitcoin is fuck you money. That's it. That's the tweet. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's a good tweet. That's how I get 90,000 followers. Um, <laughs> that is a great tweet. Thank you. Um, no, thanks so much for having me. I have, I've been an attorney in the space since about 2013. I sort of like everyone, I think, once you get into this industry, there's no going back. There's no other area that I'd want to practice <laughs> law. And I think I got kind of lucky because I was I went to law school in San Diego. That's where Silvergate Bank was located. And as a third year attorney, they recruited me to be in-house counsel of the of the crypto banking practice that they were starting. So really early on in my career, I just had this insane bird's eye view of the whole industry of all yeah. of these companies that wanted bank accounts. Um, and I knew that I'd never be able to go back to like traditional law again. I could never do something that's just, yeah, this is so cutting edge every day. There's news. This is a very coincidental day to have <laughs> already had scheduled me coming on. But um, yeah, I just love this industry and I deal with all things regulatory. So a, a crypto lawyer could be all sorts of things. It could be contractual, um, corporate contractual work. It could be disputes work. It could be tax. I've always focused on regulatory. So you listed all these federal regulators that um, oversee the space in the United States. And I help clients on the front end with how to comply with the requirements. And I help them on the back end if they haven't hired me early enough and they've made some mistakes. And now they are, <laughs> you know, being questioned or investigated by FinCEN or OFAC or the SEC. So, um, yeah, I love this industry. It's amazing. Um, and so yeah. Bitcoin is fucking money. I said that because I feel like just especially over the last few years, the amount of inflation, um, money printing and just the economy in general, like I want to get as far away from that in my personal life as possible. So, you know, just my day to day, I invest heavily in Bitcoin and I have for quite a while. And um, so I'm excited about the space and for multiple reasons. Awesome. Before we dive into XRP, because that's on everyone's minds at the moment, yeah. when you first started out on your journey as like in traditional finance and the moving of like really large sums of uh, money, I, I think everyone would find that transition very interesting. Could you just share that in brief? Yeah. So um, I spent, I graduated law school past the bar in California and I spent one year in traditional corporate law as an associate and I just hated it. I wanted to be, I wanted to be in house. I wanted to be somewhere where I was learning new things and having to sort of apply old law to a new technology. I didn't know if it should be fintech or like self-driving cars or what industry it should be. But as a second year attorney, I joined a company in San Diego called DollarX. And what they were doing is wholesale currency exchange for little exchange centers along the Mexico and San Diego border. Those companies can't get bank accounts, right? There's there's Mexican drug cartel concerns. There's money laundering <laughs> concerns. Like there's like it's like fully there. And um, and they were doing this company was doing wholesale currency. So the armored cars going to pick cash along the Mexico border, you know, converting those to pesos or dollars and then taking that physical cash to the bank for these companies. And um, yeah, when I joined, I didn't know about anti-money laundering. I didn't know about financial regulation. It's not something you're taught in law school and it's not something that you study for on the bar exam. Um, but I really quickly started to understand the importance of it. And then I just saw the crazy friction of traditional finance and like 
the idea of needing to actually physically carry bags of paper in an armored car. Um, and at the same time, I started learning about Bitcoin and I was like, that makes much more sense to me, uh, you know, as someone who grew up with the Internet and emails and text messages and, you know, that whole evolution like that just it seems like a no brainer to me. So I pretty quickly uh, and that's that's about the time Silvergate was like, we want to bank this industry, but we need to create the program to do it, to explain to our regulators why Coinbase can be a, a banking partner, like bank with us and why Gemini and all these like big name exchanges and companies could be, you know, clients of the bank. Um, so it was kind of this perfect, perfect storm and time to pivot to to Bitcoin and crypto. 100%. You couldn't have timed it any better. Yeah. Definitely want to dive into Silvergate and Coinbase. I guess everyone wants to find out about what's going on uh, with XRP yeah. with today. Absolutely huge news. I've got a couple of dot points um, which I'll share. And then if you can expand from your perspective, which will be a lot more in depth than 99% of market participants. A yeah. uh, couple of the facts that we know, the offer and sale of XRP on digital asset uh, platforms did not amount to offers and sales of investment contracts. Uh, the record cannot establish the third Howie prong to these transactions. Um, and then there's a couple of, um, there's a great tweet by Bill Hughes talking about institutional sales of the tokens violated federal security laws, but programmatic sales did not, um, a court ruled. I've got a few more, but if you just want to start that, otherwise might start overwhelming people with too much uh, information okay. straight away. Yeah. I mean, I think I would first set the backdrop a little that the SEC has just in the United States has just been such an uncooperative regulator with the industry. They have gone after projects after they failed or after they've had successes and going after those projects through enforcement actions uh, is really detrimental to the people that choose to hold a certain cryptocurrency. Um, and it's a good time to remember that the SEC is charged with investor protection, right? So like the SEC is supposed to protect consumers. That means catching the FTXs of the world before they happen, which they didn't. Um, and it means protecting consumers um, in terms of disclosures and consumers being able to walk into transactions with eyes wide open, not an enforcement action three, four years down the road that just results in all these exchanges having to delist the token, the price crashing. That's not investor protection at all. And if anything, it's harming investors. So I think that like the industry for a long time has been frustrated by that, right? They've been frustrated that even if these tokens are securities, the SEC has not made it clear just this is the path forward. These are the things that you should be disclosing to customers we're going to proactively regulate. We're not going to do it through enforcement actions. So when the you know lawsuit between the SEC and, and Ripple first started, it was a perfect example of the SEC once again waiting a few years, a lot of people investing in it, and then them going after a project after the fact. Um, all these exchanges delisted XRP, the price dropped, the holders were frustrated, um, and a lot of attorneys in the space as, and including in-house at Ripple have done a really good job drawing nuance between, well, what if, what if it's a token sell to institutional? What if it's to retail? What if it's the secondary market sales? So, you know, today's news was the first time I feel like in a long time that the industry can kind of celebrate a win against the SEC. Um, I tweeted today, I was like, I would love to be a fly on the wall at the SEC today because I just can't imagine. Uh, <laughs> I think they thought that this was a very clear cut example. There's, it's, a, it's a centralized company. You know, there's, there's executives who have profited from this. Um, a lot of money has sort of, quote unquote, been raised by the sale of XRP. But this is like the rule of law kind of working itself out, right? And a judge is saying... He's, he was saying, you know, the institutional sales were securities, the programmatic sales and distributions to even employees were not. Um, interestingly, he pointed out, like, when you are giving, you know, if sales or giving tokens to employees almost as a benefit, 
those employees haven't paid money. And that's the first prong of the Howey test. So I thought the court did a really good job in their opinion, really going through the rationale there. The interesting thing to me is that the court didn't want to opine and didn't go to the level of talking about secondary market sales. Um, And so I think there's still some questions to be answered. And unfortunately, you know, this isn't binding. It's not it's not binding on other courts, especially higher courts. It's not a Supreme Court case. It can be appealed. There are still things that can, and I, you know, I fully anticipate the SEC will appeal this. So it's certainly not like sort of the final win, um, but it it shows that the SEC doesn't have a clear argument that they seem to always say. You know, they they seem very comfortable just coming out and saying that's a security, that's a security. Coinbase, you're listing unregistered securities. Like, well, you have to prove it. If someone challenges you, the SEC is going to have to prove it. And I think that what we saw today is, you know, judges may not always agree with the SEC stance. With this, XRP win is great for the XRP community, but it is non-binding. What exactly does that mean? Can you break that down to a more simplistic uh, point of view? Yeah, so if you think of the way, you know, courts work. Uh, this was this came from the Southern District of New York. So it's a district court case um, and it's that judge's opinion. Um, there are ways in which this can and probably will be appealed to, you know, other circuits, court of appeals. Um, obviously the the law of the of the land is the Supreme Court. And so when you have just a circuit court, a district court opinion, um, that does not have the same binding effect. Another circuit uh, another district could have a different opinion about about this same case. Um, and so that's why I definitely am not taking away from what it means. Um, it's a huge win for Ripple and XRP holders. And I would say the industry as a whole, even though me personally, I invest just in Bitcoin. Um, I think anything that the industry can do to put some pressure on the SEC to behave differently um, to not waste companies' time and resources with these enforcement actions and litigation and instead be proactively, it's really important. Um, but it's definitely, you know, I've seen some people take the stance that this is like a big enough win to sort of say that ICOs are back in a place where it's okay to do them in the United States or that there's clarity. And, you know, like Coinbase and Kraken today chose to relist those, uh, to relist XRP that definitely says something about the confidence they were able to glean from this district court case. But it's just not, you know, unfortunately, the legal process is very long. um, And this is certainly not the sort of final stage of this of this story. Yep. For uh, someone that has sort of insider knowledge, how much longer could this court case go on for? Like we've had a win today, everyone's celebrating, like the price was up 76% last time I had a look. Everyone's sort of thinking or celebrating like this is done and dusted, but it can get escalated. A lot more can happen. When are we going to have closure on this whole thing? I mean, unfortunately, that's really hard to predict, and I would say it could take years. Um, but, wow. but what I think is more noteworthy is, regardless of the direction this actually goes, if there's an appeal, if there's a, you know a, sort of a new a new trial about it and litigation about it, um, I do think that the tides are turning, even in the way other you know regulators, the government, members of Congress are viewing how the SEC has handled this industry. Um, So I think the win today, regardless of where it goes and regardless of how long it takes, um, it is changing the tide and it's far past time for Congress or someone to step in um, and try to bring some more proactive clarity here because people have been screaming about this for years that like we're actually losing innovation in the United States. I have clients that come to me and their biggest ask is, how can we have a token? We'll, we'll move out of the United States. We won't have U.S. consumers. We won't market to the United States. You know, companies feel like that's their only option. Um, and there are members of the SEC, including Hester Peirce, that I think have been more forward thinking about that. Um, yeah. The U.K. introduced law last week just about how crypto should be marketed and how, like, 
financial disclosure should be made. That's the way you actually protect investors, right? You give them the decision. We let people walk into casinos all day and lose money, but they know what they're <laughs> signing up for, right? They know what they're signing up for. In this case, like we, the SEC just has not handled this industry in a way that actually increases the disclosures that can, the investors are receiving. Um, and I think that today's win is going to light the fire a little bit more under the people who have been asking for a change in approach. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. If even if the guidelines that they came up with weren't as favorable as what people in the crypto industry would write themselves, right. at least that gives people like a point of reference or a framework that they can work inside and then they can play within that sandbox or right. within the letter of the law. And people can get pretty creative and stuff, but at least it allows them to know what the rules of the game are. For me, you know, here in Australia, the opposite side of the world, Australia is pretty good with our crypto regulation, but the United States being the biggest market, if it's not clear, and it affects the crypto market worldwide globally. Yeah. Um, so it would be nice for everyone if we could see more and more coming out of that. So I guess this sort of relates to what's going on with BlackRock as well, because recently they put in for an ETF, um, like 99.9% win rate on their ETFs or 98% yeah. win rate as well. So they, I guess two questions, do they have insider knowledge? Are they really close with the SEC? Do, do they know something that nobody else that's tried to put in a, a spot Bitcoin ETF has, or they're just so good at what they do, they found it's just the right time to go ahead and this will start to push the crypto industry in the right direction, or is that just hopium from my point of view? You know, when it when I first started, there was that flood of applications sort of from traditional financial companies, Fidelity, BlackRock, and all of a sudden I thought, what weird timing for that? Like, why would they possibly feel like right now is the time to do that? Because the SEC has consistently been rejecting spot Bitcoin, Bitcoin spot ETF applications. Um, they, you know, I think it was like the same week that the enforcement actions were brought against Coinbase and Binance. Um, it just felt like interesting timing. So, you know, I don't have any insight on this, but my initial response was, wow, they must have had some positive conversations with the SEC and feel like right now is a good time. I mean, I do think that the SEC has been very um, to the point that their, you know, alleged concern about a spot Bitcoin ETF is that companies have not demonstrated that they can mitigate the fact that the industry is prone to market manipulation. Now, other countries have spot Bitcoin ETFs. The SEC's approved futures ETFs here in the United States using that same sort of methodology of preventing market manipulation, but that's what they've said all along. So if you know BlackRock or these other traditional financial institutions have been able to demonstrate more sort of expertise in that area, or sort of are partnering with entities like Coinbase that will help demonstrate that they can prevent market manipulation, uh, I think you know I think that that's how we're going to get more likely than not an approved Bitcoin spot ETF. Um, and for me, as just like a Bitcoin believer and holder, I have mixed feelings about whether I will, will be frustrated if it's a traditional financial company that gets approved before all these sort of like deeply crypto companies that have applied for this for years. But regardless, it'll be really good for the industry and adoption uh, and the price. And um, so, yeah, it, it's it's really interesting. I. I personally have been feeling like uh, an approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF could happen this year um, based on some of the players that have been getting into the space the way they have. Yeah, so you could see the approval happening as early as sometime this year I with this. I personally can. Like I said, I have no insight into this from like my, my role as a partner at Brown Rudnick, but just like my 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 guts usually ride on some of these things. I mean, I even yeah. I had wrote a Forbes article about a year and a half ago titled Coinbase is ready to fight the SEC. And then a year and a half later, Coinbase files a writ of mandamus and goes after the SEC. Like sometimes I can just see 
uh, yeah, just have my spidey senses up and I, I can see it happening. Yeah. I guess when you're so focused in one particular area like crypto law, you start to see that pattern recognition and you're just going to have things pop into your mind with maybe even not knowing how they came there, but you're like, yeah. all right, I can see this happening and going there. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. With um, BlackRock, well, I guess the SEC has been saying to the crypto industry for a while that they need to have something like the SSA, the Surveillance Sharing Agreement yeah. in place and these parameters for a Bitcoin ETF to be approved. Why did nobody else take the SEC up on that offer earlier and it had to take BlackRock to be able to implement something like that? I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I think that if we're talking about some of the previously filed Bitcoin spot ETFs, like those were other major players in the industry and maybe Coinbase or a company like Coinbase is more willing to sort of partner with a traditional financial company uh, because there's some rep reputational risk there. There's some, you know, contractual risk there. Um, so I don't really know the answer to that, but I definitely think that the surveillance piece is the key piece. And at least unlike a lot of times, the SEC has been clear about that even if it doesn't make sense uh, to other pe to others because of the fact that we have Bitcoin futures ETFs, um, you know, they've just gone back to this surveillance and prevention of market manipulation aspect. Um, so if someone can find that secret sauce to get the SEC on board, uh, I think we might see it. A lot of people within crypto uh, very much against the establishment, especially the SEC with the actions that they've been taking. And we call this Operation Choke Point 2.0, shutting down the banking partners. Is this a conspiracy or in, in your opinion, do you see that it is actually hap happening or these banks have just failed because they have done the wrong thing? Everyone in the crypto industry is saying, no, the SEC regulation is out to get us. Yeah. Um, um I think that regulation in some way is out to get the crypto industry. I think that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency challenges the way that governments and politicians traditionally were able to make money um, and control money. Um, and so I do think it's a huge threat. Um, you know, when we talk about choke point 2.0, 1.0 was when the banking system really came after uh, companies selling guns and ammunition and that sort of thing. And there's this well like well respected idea that the banking system shouldn't debank an entire industry for any reason um but i think that what we've seen with silvergate signature these crypto friendly banks that really helped with adoption in the early days um and then the sec going after the coinbase and binance and these various exchanges in some ways the government and regulators are going after the two main sources of within the flow of funds, right? Because if you think about it, to increase adoption, let's just use Bitcoin, for example, to increase Bitcoin adoption and the purchase of Bitcoin, newcomers want to go to someone like Coinbase. It's easy. It looks safe. It's easy onboarding. Uh, they're a publicly traded company, right? So, you know, they want to come to a these exchange, these centralized exchanges, they don't want to go try to figure out DeFi or swaps or, you know, these other platforms. So, so that's the first way someone gets into the industry. Then Coinbase needs to be able to go take my, my dollars, your dollars, all the dollars that have been converted from, you know, USD to Bitcoin. They need to be able to turn around and put it into a bank account. If you attack like sort of exchanges ability to operate in both those ways, um, you're going right towards to like the heart of mass adoption. Um, I mean, the the thing that I've been saying since FTX and some of these other companies collapsed is anytime there is sort of a bad actor in the industry, it gives regulators that excuse, right? That that thing to point to and say, see, we told you so. We, we told you you shouldn't bake this industry. We said this industry needed to be more regulated. Um, and it lets them sort of act like that's the justification for the actions or, oh, you know, Silvergate is collateral damage from the FTX fallout or something like that. But if, if bad actors in the industry didn't give regulators talking points like that, 
we'd much we'd be much better off being able to defend ourselves and say, wait a second, like banks should be able to provide bank accounts to any legitimate companies that aren't breaking the law, that aren't, you know, stealing money or committing money laundering. Any legitimate industry should be able to get a bank account including crypto. But I even saw today that Bank of America is closing people's bank accounts for purchasing Bitcoin. Um, that's something yeah. we heard about five years ago, 10 years ago, like for that to be happening today at Bank of America is just crazy to me. A few days after, by the way, it, it, there was news that Bank of America was opening fake accounts and charging undisclosed fees and things like that. So I just think that I think sometimes, um, government agencies are sort of in the back pocket of traditional finance. Um, and so they do things to help and they have ulterior motives in sort of how they approach this industry. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear for everyone in the States that does bank with Bank of America and Australia, the same thing's happening with Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Westpac. They're really limiting you know, the amount of money that you can send to a centralized exchange. They put my funds on hold last week for 30 hours. I had to call them to be able to send it there. I've sent large amounts of money from that bank account to my crypto exchange. They said it was the first time I've ever done it because they brought out these new laws, put it on hold. Won't let me spend my own money, which is crazy. But when they hold it, it's their money uh, legally by definition. A, a question, and this is going really uh, far out. FTX and Sam Bankman freed met with the SEC, met with a lot of politicians, connected to a lot of politicians with his family. Is it possible that all of this was just a big setup and it was done by design and they used FTX to create a problem, orchestrate the problem, and then with the regulation, that's the solution. We need to regulate this industry more or is, or SBF was just a bad actor and then now realise they made a mistake? I don't think it's as um, sort of blunt as him being sort of in on it with the regulators. But I do think that when you donate to politicians and you buddy up to regulators, um, you aren't under the same level of scrutiny as you would be. So I think I think of it more as, um, you know, and I, I've heard reports that um, you know, SBF and family members also were talking to the Biden administration and different people within the government in terms of a completely different topic, which was sort of um, COVID and pandemic prevents in the future. You know, so who knows what all the motives going on there were. Um, but I do think that um, I think eventually like the SEC should have to answer for why they've gone after every other exchange um, and never went after the one that has hurt so many consumers. Um, so I guess my answer is I don't think it was that um, sort of, I don't think it was a collaboration or that the, that the SEC was <laughs> in on it, but I think that, um, I think that money talks uh, and I think that money can get the um, uh, yeah, bullseye off you. Yeah, just sort of make them look in, in the opposite direction. Uh, so you used to work at, at Coinbase as well. Obviously, the SEC has gone after Coinbase pretty hard. And it, maybe it's a little bit hard, but do you believe Coinbase has been trying to do the right things? Like I believe they've met with the SEC maybe 30 plus times in the last couple of years, um, whereas the SEC keeps saying like, here's the roadmap. This is what you guys need to do. You're just not doing it. And then they put out all this enforcement. And then Coinbase is like, we've been trying, we've been trying, we've been trying. Who's right and who's wrong? Or is it a little bit more nuanced? I mean, it, it is nuanced, but the SEC is wrong because um, <laughs> you look, I, the way I think about it, like I started my career even before Coinbase, I was with Bitflyer and I helped Bitflyer get the Ford fourth ever New York bit license, right? In that process, when, a, com when a, a regulator has some sort of like strict license application process, the very least 
they can do is at least be there to answer questions and to sort of brainstorm if something's not working, right? Like if, if the new technology is making something very confusing and convoluted, it, it takes cooperation for the company and the regulator to kind of at least get some feedback. And so when I, you know, I haven't been with Coinbase for years now, but you know, they've done a lot of things that are public knowledge that I think are, uh, were them showing some deference to the SEC, right? They created the Crypto Rating Council, which it was a um, public sort of group consortium that tried to rate cryptocurrency on how likely or not it is to be a security. They acquired a broker dealer, I believe in like 2018. Um, they've, they've been public now that they, you know, have talked to the SEC more than 30 times. Once the SEC filed that insider trading complaint, not against Coinbase, but against the two, the former product manager and his family members. This was, you know, maybe a year, year and a half ago. As soon as that happened, that's when I started to think the SEC cannot be alleging a employee did insider trading of securities. The next logical step is that the SEC is also saying Coinbase lists securities. And so when they did that, I mean, I knew I had a good feeling it was going to go in a direction like this. But if if a company like Coinbase, and by the way, is publicly, you know, a publicly traded company, has been approved with their current business, they had the same business model, you know, <laughs> a few years ago when they got yeah. approved to be a publicly traded company. That's a side note. But, you know, if a company can acquire a broker dealer, engage with the SEC 30 times, and have it still just result in an enforcement action and litigation, I mean, then no one has a shot, right? Like, I mean, then, then what could anybody do? I mean, I think that we will move into a direction eventually where the SEC makes it clear how a token become can become a registered security and how an exchange can be a ro regulated broker-dealer ATS. But it doesn't seem like that's where we are currently. Um, and I think, like, I totally understand Coinbase's stance in frustration against the SEC. It just is yeah. it's like a catch-22. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it definitely makes it very hard for them when there's no clarity. And, and they don't know what to do, what to keep up there, what like what to list, what to delist. They're trying to run a business here and be able to offer this new technology to everyone. Some things are very exciting. Other things are scams. But as an investor or a speculator or a gambler, like like you are saying earlier, we can walk into a casino yeah. and they're designed to steal your money. I'm sure a lot of crypto projects are securities and designed to take your money as well. That happens fairly often. But if there's rules and regulations and it's just clear, then it'll allow investors to be able to make an informed decision and it's fair game. As long as the founder, the team doesn't rip people off, then it's just up to the market to be able to choose whether it's worthwhile, the price appreciates. If they don't like it, it's going to drop. And then that needs to be measured against Bitcoin as well. Yeah. I, um, for me, it makes no sense. The way that I'm starting to think about it is they are trying to push crypto sort of out of the way and then maybe have traditional finance or the big banks to be able to offer things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, we'll get BlackRock with the ETF. And they may push all, all DeFi out of the way, which would be very sad because there is some incredible innovation happening there. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that comment. Yeah, I mean... It's funny because I can, you know, my Twitter handle is Haley Lennon BTC. I've always been a Bitcoiner, but I'm also a libertarian and believe in an open market, right? A free market where people, if they want to buy Pepe coin, they can buy Pepe coin. If they lose money and they were informed about the risk of that, it's all fair game, right? So I, I'm not... Yeah. Uh, I agree with what you said earlier, where there are projects that are blatant scams and rug pulls uh, and Ponzi schemes, and those things should be shut out from the industry much quicker by, you know, I think that people in the industry are pretty noisy about it when when projects start looking that way, and then regulators move pretty, pretty slowly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the clearest way to me is for companies 
any crypto companies, whether you're a security or not, to have some re required consumer protection type disclosures and disclaimers that inform the general public about the risks associated with it and the volatility um, and the risk of losing it if, if it's on an exchange and they go bankrupt, how you're going to be treated as a creditor, as an unsecured creditor. These are all things that like people didn't really realize, right? Like even if they knew they were gambling or investing in, in things that might not have, you know, infinite potential in the future. I think there's still a lot about the way the industry and these bankruptcies have worked. The, the average consumer just had no idea. Now think about, you know, someone who's much older that just wants to buy a little Bitcoin and tries to keep it on an exchange, earn some interest, they lose it all. I mean, so it's, it's sad, you know, it's, it, uh, the way that it's regulated in the United States has not protect, protected consumers. And I would argue that people in the industry have incentive to want regulation to work and protect consumers because anytime there's all these like horrible headline news, it's just a negative thing for, for Bitcoin and adoption and trying to get our messaging out about it. Um, so yeah, I, I wish that, I wish that the SEC would pivot in how they approach this space and actually protect consumers. It's not like my, my, opinion as a lawyer isn't like there's no role for the sec they need to get out of here and let everyone do whatever they want no but the role could be much more productive and efficient in how it's protecting consumers yeah yeah very often i say most people in crypto don't like regulation. They think it's a bad thing. I'm actually more in favour for it because that's how we get the big institutional players to be able to come in. It becomes more mainstream. My mum, my grandparents right. can buy Bitcoin and feel safe. All of these things are good. We just need to know what the rules are. Yep. And then say you buy a BlackRock ETF. Great, fantastic. I won't be. But it gives people exposure to Bitcoin and then they start reading maybe safe Dina moves to the Bitcoin standard yep. here and they realize that they need to take self-custody. Yep. So through regulation, that can be amazingly positive for the space. So this leads me on to, it seems like there's this war between the SEC and the CFTC. They're both trying to be top dog and rule this space. How do you see that playing out into the future? And then we'll dive into Alex Mashensky after this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it's so the SEC and CFTC, it's so interesting. Other countries have, when it comes to an industry or the way, you know, a certain, yeah, a certain asset class has like one prudential regulator, right? But very early on, we started seeing like the CFTC being like, oh, Bitcoin's in my bucket, it's a commodity. And the SEC saying everything else is a security, it's all securities. Look at the Howey test, it's obvious. Um, you know, so there's been some um like jurisdictional land grabbing right because both of these regulators want to regulate the space they they regulate them very differently right so the sec regulates securities if something is a security let's let's say xrp were a security it would need to become a registered security offering with the sec maybe through a form 10 a bunch of disclosures that sort of thing um, commodities under the CFTC are, um, there's still regulation and some of it has to do with market and, you know, anti-market manipulation and surveillance type things. Um, but I would say that it's much, uh, lighter touch. And so for a long time, you know, people really wanted more tokens to be considered commodities and like how, where, where that line is drawn just to be more clear. Um, I think that you know, going back to what we talked about earlier with the Ripple XRP, um, you know, today's like opinion makes it even more clear that that line between what's a commodity and what's a security and what is it if it's neither of those things. I mean, there's just a lot of clarity that needs to still be parsed out. And that's why I think there's calls for like Congress or legislation to get involved, because if you you know, if you have the CFTC and the SEC in the same room today, I don't even think they'd agree about Ethereum. I mean, I think the SEC yeah. would say Ethereum's a security and the CFTC would say, no, it's over here. And um, so there needs to be some, there needs to be an adult in the room, a mediator that kind of helps with this. 
<laughs> yeah, G- Gary Gensler's famously not been willing to say whether Ethereum is or isn't a security. Right. It just leaves it so ambiguous uh, for everyone. So a-, a question being on the other side of the world, the way I see the SEC and the CFTC is they're both government entities. So they should be on the same team. But like you're saying, we need to have an adult in the room. Why can't they just get together and be like, you have Bitcoin, we'll take Ethereum. The rest of them will work on a case by case basis. Why does it have to be so complicated? Is it about earning money or advancing their career so that, say, Gary Gensler can move to wherever he wants to? I don't know why anyone would employ that man, but... Is that posturing that's going on or why can't they just work together and move forward and allow us to grow as an industry? Yeah, there's a few reasons. One is that both like the analysis of whether something is a security is such a fact intensive analysis, right? You're looking at the Howey test and these four prongs and you're weighing them. And if all four prongs are met, then it is a security. But there's been statements by you know previous chairmen that something can start as a security and morph into not a security. And then does it become a commodity at that point? Like there's just, it's not clear, but I mean, yeah, when you talk about like actual incentives, um, you know, if Gary Ginsler can, you know, target himself or, you know, prove that he should be regulating most of this industry, almost all the tokens, um, then he has justification for more budget. Um, enforcement actions lead to fines that that the SEC makes. So like regulators have a different goal when it comes to like doing good at their job, right? Like, I mean, you would like to think that the SEC wants to be good at their job by actually protecting consumers. It seems like they want to be good at their job by having more tokens to go after, more enforcement actions, more fines, more litigation, more wins. Um, And so, yeah, I just don't, I think that the two regulators just have sort of unaligned incentives to figure out how to um, regulate this industry. And I mean, it would be great if we just had one prudential regulator that regulated the space in a very proactive, informed way, but we don't have that. So (laughs) it's just a mess. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Is that sort of like the police force? Like here, the motto for the police is to serve and protect, which means to like if there's crime going on, they're going to show up, they're going to stop that, they're going to make the world a safer place. But what we see here is they create all these rules and it's enforcement. It's just about accumulating as much money through fining people as possible instead of actually doing what they're mandated to do, which is serve and to protect. Yeah. Is that a similar? Yeah, I would argue that um, I would argue that if all if the SEC got into a room and really discussed, you know, you have to think about like what the regulation is and how efficiently it's meeting the goals, right? So like are enforcement actions on the back end really the most efficient way to protect consumers? I don't think so. So to me, yeah, it it sounds pretty similar. I mean, I think there's an abuse of power in a way um, where it's more about um, getting more jurisdiction, more regulatory jurisdiction. Um, You know, as you mentioned, there's there's been talks of Gary Gensler wanting to become secretary of the treasury. Um, Janet Yellen is notoriously anti-crypto. So, I mean, he used to teach at MIT about Bitcoin. Like he didn't, he wasn't always, um, he he wasn't always so sort of uncooperative. I mean, there was even a video that came out when Algorand was listed as a security and then a video (laughs) came out of him like on stage, like, talking about Algorand like years ago before he was at the SEC all excited about it and it's like how do you how do you change your opinion on that so quickly so it's uh it's crazy it's uh makes me want to knock my head against the wall (laughs) (laughs) or knock his head against the wall my words not yours (laughs) uh so 
Let's dive into Alex Mashensky, but first I just want a big shout out to Natalie Brunel for connecting us. Yeah. I'll link the videos. I believe you've done two videos with her, maybe a few more, but there's a really good one with you and Natalie that I'll put in the description, as well as all your links and your Twitter with the 90,000 followers there. Make sure you are following Haley. but thank you so much, yeah. Natalie. I agree. I've, I've, now, known, I've known Natalie forever and she's a amazing resource in the industry and i'm glad she connected us too natalie is ab absolutely incredible she's the first one as like the biggest brightest minds in bitcoin that i had on my list and to have her there as the goal to have her on it was such a treat yeah. such an honor yeah. really everyone make sure you subscribe to natalie as well you're in for a treat if you haven't already yeah. done that so Alex Mashensky uh, sounds like he's been charged today. Massive fines going on there as well. Um, maybe if you can unpack to that a little bit what's going on and what this means for everyone going forward that may have invested in Celsius. Yeah, so I mean, there's a few things that are interesting about this. Like you mentioned, we did see a bunch of charges from various regulatory bodies um, today about about Celsius and against Alex Mashinsky. The fines are interesting because the company is uh, in bankruptcy, right? They they don't they likely don't have funds to cover those fines. So I think that um, what's more interesting is that you know. The, the fall of Celsius happened, I don't know, a year, a year and a half ago, maybe two years. I lose track of time these days. But um, then he was just out walking around. It's like the whole industry knew that there was something so wrong about what had happened. And he was still going to conferences and just showing his face and on Twitter. And it's like, what is happening? You start to lose yeah. the faith in the fact that bad actors will be held responsible for their actions. So for me today was, was a big deal. Um, I wasn't surprised that it was happened like that. I've, just, I've heard different reports about whether he's actually already been arrested and in custody yet. Um, so I'm not quite sure on that part, but you know, unfortunately like the rule of law takes a long time. If harm isn't like currently happening and as we've been talking about, like the harm Celsius had caused was already over and done with, right? People are now stuck in bankruptcy proceedings. So I don't think that regulators were as urgently putting, you know, they took their time putting the case together against him. Um, and now we're seeing the results of that. And I just think that in an industry where there's been way too many bad actors over the last two years, um, having some people held responsible for those actions, um, it's, it's rewarding, right? It's, it, 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 it makes their, it helps incentivize this industry to have good people in it, right? If you see a bunch of bad yeah. stuff happening um, and then there's not justice involved, it's really disheartening. So that was, that was sort of what I noticed the most about today in the news was just sort of like a collective sigh of relief. Like, okay, great. You can't just be like walking around conferences after like really harming so many consumers. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, SBF and, and the you know charges against him. Um, it's just been a really long two years. <laughs> like, I'm kind of exhausted <laughs> with it all, but, uh, but I remain bullish on Bitcoin and the industry. So it's, you know, it's just sometimes you have to unplug and kind of step back from it and know that it's all going to play out the way it's, it's supposed to. Yeah, Bitcoin will be top dog. I think that's the way it's meant to be. Um, and it has been a really insane last couple of years, all of it, and a, a lot of implosions and then all the banks as well. Yeah. We did touch on the banks earlier, obviously with yourself working at Silvergate Bank. I just want to unpack that a little bit more. With the banks trying to bank crypto exchanges, projects, do you believe they had the the right intentions and as more from outside forces that they either got shut down or they had bank runs? Was it due to crypto or was it more for them buying bonds? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I, what I will say is that from my time working there, most of the people I worked with and helped create the banking program at Silvergate Bank we're, are still there and they are people I think very highly of. Um, there are definitely other 
organizations in the industry that I don't think highly of. So I can I can say that with the utmost confidence that the goals of Silvergate were to support the crypto space, to get deposits, to help with some of the other aspects of their business. Um, I think that crypto exposed, it exposes banks to reputational risk. Um, and so part of my job when I was there, and again, this was back 2013, 2014. So I haven't had any insight or inside information on what's been going on there with regulators and things. But, you know, part of it is that you really want to know that you're doing the due diligence and only providing banking services to good companies, you know, companies that uh, were handling things the right way. Um, and so I think that there's aspects of, of bonds and how they were managing things. I think that there were sort of reputational and collateral damage from the FTX fallout. Um, and I think that allowed regulators to put pressure on them and sort of force force a closure. Um, and again, I think it goes back to it, it, it is an attack on the industry because, I mean, banks, other banks outside of the crypto space provide banking services to companies that end up being fraudulent all the time, or the banks themselves end up doing something fraudulent. Um, so the fact that, you know, Silvergate was so ingrained in the crypto space and happened to also, you know, they had the Send network, which was sort of a network of different exchanges, you know, FTX was part of that, um, in my mind. And again, I don't have insight into what the full cause of everything was, but in my mind, you know, Silvergate's signature, those banks deserve to still be around. No, thank you. That's really helpful diving in a bit deeper. Um, Haley, you're the founder of Crypto Connect, which is domestic and international meetups. Is that Bitcoin only? And can you dive into a little bit more of what that is and why you started yeah. Crypto Connect? Yeah. So the idea behind Crypto Connect came to me about a year and a half, two years ago. I was doing a road trip from California to Austin. I had gone an Airbnb in Austin for a month um, to try out potentially living there. But I did a road trip and I kept using just my Twitter account to be like, hey, I'm in uh, Las Vegas tonight. Are there any Bitcoiners around that would want to do like an impromptu meetup or I'm in Phoenix? Is anyone there? And I was like, this is such an impractical way to have to sort of like dox myself, like as a woman traveling across the country to be able to have to like tweet where I'm going to be and then go meet a bunch of strangers and hope that everyone's yeah. like good people. But I ended up doing that and, and you know, going to, to bars and restaurants and having these impromptu meetups and also kind of peeing into Bitcoin meetups that already existed there, you know, and having people say, oh, yeah, if you're going to be here on Thursday, I'll, I'll like reach out to my group and kind of host something. So I met all these incredible people. And at the same time, I feel like it's gotten a little quieter now. But for a long time, there was this big wave of people saying we don't have enough women in the industry there's not enough women in bitcoin and it was actually started to frustrate me because i had so many amazing female friends through the years that did amazing things like aubrey strobel who was the head of marketing at lolly um natalie was getting into the space a ton and i just knew all these like incredible women so i started talking to them about this idea of uh, a women-led organization like the board of directors is all women um, cool. that would serve as sort of um, an umbrella organization for the industry. So we have different chapters. We launched in 12 different cities and then we added eight more. And it's sort of like having chapter organizations in those cities. So if you lived in Los Angeles, you could be part of Crypto Connect Los Angeles. Um, as we talked about earlier, I'm a Bitcoiner, but I felt like Crypto Connect was just more of like an inclusion inclusionary name for what the organization yeah. was meant to do, just kind of like connecting people, being a resource for people. So um, yeah, it's been every, all the women on the board, including myself have numerous other day jobs and families and things. So we've been brainstorming lately on how we can better partner with already existing meetups rather than throwing our own events, which is what we started to do last year is actually hosting events in all these cities um, so now we're working on on partnering maybe with local Bitcoin meetups, maybe some apps that already exist um, to just sort of integrate. But we have a we have a, you know, member base of about 7000 people that signed up within the yeah. first of us announcing. So and we did have plans to expand internationally. It's just 
I don't want to bite too much and <laughs> bite off more than I can chew today. <laughs> massive undertaking especially like you're saying the last two years have been wild yeah. within crypto within bitcoin so slow and steady i've got some rapid fire questions uh, for everyone crypto connector put that link below as well there's some amazing resources there for you to all do so rapid fire Haley, uh, all crypto security like gary believes no i don't think all cryptocurrencies are securities i think Many have that, you know, uh, day one have things that would make them potentially pass all the prongs of how we test. But I think that there just needs to be more nuance or optionality for, for crypto companies in the U.S. Awesome. Um, if people didn't hear you say it earlier, are you Bitcoin only or are you a bit of an altcoin degen as well? I'm Bitcoin only, although I one time said that and, and then had someone screenshot me talking about Zcash once. So I have invested <laughs> in Zcash, a little bit of Zcash, like a few hundred dollars, a little bit of basic attention token. There's a few projects that I was just interested in sort of a few years ago or, or, or became friends with the founder and was interested in the project. But today I'm Bitcoin only and I think I'll, I think I'll always, always be in the future. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely no stress. What book have you gifted the most in your life? It doesn't need to be crypto related. You know what? I don't gift books a lot, to be honest, but there are, I, I just received B is for Bitcoin, um, which is like a child ABC book about Bitcoin um, and all yeah. the coins and stuff. And I'm definitely my, that, that's a book that I'm planning to start gifting to a lot of my friends that are having children and wanting just like, a fun gift to give them maybe along with a little bit of bitcoin um to kind of start start the kid's life off on the right note yeah it, i've got another amazing interview on someone else it hasn't come out yet but someone else was talking about that book as well oh. uh, which is very exciting uh will blackrock benefit or hinder bitcoin um it will benefit bitcoin if you think of it in terms of more adoption um, and more exposure and, and people who wouldn't want to hold Bitcoin on their own to understand the industry a little bit more. So I think all in all, it'll be a benefit. Definitely agree. Gary Gensler, is he doing his job by the law or stepping outside of his box? I think we've talked about this uh, a lot today. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think, I think Gary Gensler has some room for improvement i'll put it that way <laughs> cool and last question you used to collect coins as a kid why was that um you know it's funny i, I almost still do i was in boston um a few weeks ago and found this like coin store and went in there and started looking at it i just there's something to me that's so interesting about how money has changed forms over time how you know some societies did like the bartering system and cowrie shells um and as a little kid i was just obsessed with coins and like the two dollar bill and things like that so it's kind of interesting that i then yeah have become a crypto lawyer because to me to me money is freedom um and i didn't obviously think of it that way when i was a little kid collecting coins but yeah i just think it's really neat there's a lot of history to them um you know, there's some really old coins I saw when I was in Boston from um, from like Greece and things like that. It's just it's just neat that it's sort of this global thing that that we've always dealt with. Hundred percent. Yeah, well, I used to collect them too, and yeah. and in a way, I still do. Yeah. Um, I call it monopoly money, but uh, still very fascinating that progression as well. Yeah. And would you have a message that you'd like to pass on to everyone in the Bitcoin and crypto community? Your parting words. Oh, no, I appreciate you having me on today. I think this industry has some of the brightest minds that I've come across. I mean, you know, even thinking yeah. of my years in law school and in traditional law, I mean, I just think that we have just some really, really amazing people in the industry. And I feel honored a lot to be associated with the industry in that way. So um, stay bullish, keep stacking stats. And um, thanks for having me on. Thank you so much, Haley. Everyone watching, thanks very much. Hit subscribe. All the links for Haley are below in the description. Be blessed. Peace.